Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, according to the 13th edition of Canada's Food Price Report 2023, by September last year, families across Canada were paying in excess of 10% more for their groceries. And this year, Canadians' grocery bills have increased by another 8 to 9% or more. Vegetables are seeing the biggest price increases. And as a result, Canadian families are cutting back on their purchases of vegetables and other healthy food choices for their children. About 20% of Canadians report skipping a meal each day. And food banks across the country, they're seeing record visits by Canadian families. Speaker, on this side of the House for the last few years, I've been calling to the attention the practices of Canada's big grocery retailers and their lack of competition in the grocery market. And for a couple of years now, I've been asking the Competition Bureau to investigate the grocery chains and their abuse of dominance. For the past three years, I've called on the attention of to the market concentration in the hands of big grocery retailers, the resulting lack of competition, and the consequences for producers, suppliers, and Canadian consumers. Producers and suppliers are gouged by what the big grocery retailers demand of them. Canadian consumers are gouged at the prices that the big grocery retailer retailers demand at the checkout. Now, suddenly, the Prime Minister seems to have awakened from sleeping at the wheel to what Canadian families have known as a reality every time they buy food. And where's the Prime Minister been? And now he calls in the grocery retailers? And now he introduces this bill? When was the last time the Prime Minister went to a grocery store? When was the last time the Prime Minister had to buy a Thanksgiving turkey dinner with all the trimmings? Families who can afford it will be paying a minimum of 60 to 80 dollars this year for their turkey, let alone all the trimmings. Many families who cannot afford it, well, they'll just go without. My guess is that the last time the Prime Minister visited a grocery store was sometime in the last decade, maybe. Speaker, Canadians cannot afford more of what they've suffered under eight years of this Prime Minister and his irresponsible Liberal NDP government. Canadians cannot afford this costly coalition. Speaker, the reason for food inflation is not just because of too little competition amongst grocery retailers. Beginning in 2018, the Prime Minister has been gouging Canadian families with a regressive, unfair carbon tax, we'll call this carbon tax one, and inflating it year over year. Speaker, as of April Fool's Day 2023, the Prime Minister inflated carbon tax one to $65 a tonne. And by April Fool's Day 2030, the Prime Minister wants to inflate carbon tax one to $170 a tonne. But the Prime Minister hasn't stopped there. Oh no, Speaker, this Prime Minister decided that one carbon tax is not enough. So as of Canada Day, this Prime Minister added another carbon tax. So now the Prime Minister is asking Canadians to pay not one, but two carbon taxes. And even worse, when the carbon tax is added at the pumps or on their home heating bill, Canadians are charged sales tax on top of the carbon tax. So, Speaker, there's no other way to put this. The Prime Minister and his costly coalition are charging Canadian families tax on tax. But carbon tax one and carbon tax two, well, they don't stop there. Between these two carbon taxes, by April Fool's Day 2030, the Prime Minister wants to charge Canadian farmers and truckers 69 cents for every litre of diesel that they put in their trucks. It's not rocket science. It's basic math that this NDP Liberal government just doesn't seem to get. If it costs the farmer more to grow the food and costs the trucker more to ship the food, it's going to cost Canadian families more to buy the food. The Bank of Governor, Bank of Canada Governor Tiff Macklem says, and I quote, the carbon tax announcements that have it going up, that increases inflation each year. The leader of Canada's food price report 2023, Dr. Sylvain Charlebois, has pointed out that the carbon tax has made business expenses go up. Up and down the food chain, Dr. Charlebois points to, and I quote, a compounding effect, unquote, as the supply chain is exposed to increased costs from the carbon tax. So let me illustrate. Thanks to this Prime Minister's carbon tax one and carbon tax two, even with agricultural exemptions, farmers are paying carbon taxes on various parts of their production, uh, production chain that's not covered by those exemptions. There's the carbon tax cost of heating barns with natural gas or propane when there's animals being raised. Getting produce, meat, poultry, eggs to the processors with diesel-powered trucks costs more with carbon tax. 
But wait, wait, there's more. The carbon tax paid moving that food from the processor's warehouses to the grocery stores with more diesel powered trucks. And the grocery retailers have to heat their stores, many with natural gas, propane, or in some cases, heating oil, so they're paying even more carbon tax. Consumers are traveling to and from the grocery store and are paying carbon tax on the fuel they put in their vehicles. And again, if it costs a more, farmer more to grow the food and it costs the trucker more to ship the food, it's going to cost Canadian families more to buy the food. So, Speaker, how do we solve this problem of rising food prices and the Prime Minister's costly coalition? Well, first things first, axe the carbon tax. The Leader of the Opposition and we on this side of the House want Canadian families to, to give Canadian families relief from unfair competition. We want to offer Canadian families relief from the unsustainable burden of carbon tax one and carbon tax two. One word, Speaker, enough. And as to this bill, let me make a few observations in respect to grocery retail competition. Sadly, this bill seems to be a lot of fluff and not much substance. The Prime Minister has had eight years to look into this issue and to provide legislation that would put a stop to consolidation and over-concentration of market share in the grocery ch chains. Speaker, this level of coordination of grocery stores into bigger and bigger grocery retail chains is reducing competition for consumer dollars. With less competition in the grocery retail, Canadian consumers will always pay more. So let me give you one example. I have two grocery store flyers, one from Toronto and one from Vancouver. Same store, same items. Now, Vancouver is about 2,000 kilometers or about 1,200 miles from the Central Valley of California, where most of our produce comes from, especially during the winter months. Toronto is about 4,000 kilometers or 2,500 miles from California's Central Valley. But as I compared the two prices given in, for the same prices, for the same products, for the prices for the produce were higher in the Vancouver flyer than in the Toronto flyer for the exact same items. So even though Vancouver is about a thousand miles closer to the producers than Toronto is. Why, Speaker? Well, because there's more competition in the Toronto area, with many more grocery stores available for folks at many, many small independent grocery stores. The bill makes much of the role of commissioner on competition, but I have to point out that Canada already has a competition commissioner, and further, Canada already has a competition tribunal. But Canadians still face high food prices because Canada's competition watchdogs, they just have no teeth. And it's not enough to have an official whose title is competition commissioner. If a competition commissioner is to uphold competitive pricing in the interests of Canadian consumers, this office has to have real teeth. The competition commissioner should have real power to call into question the excessive concentration of market control. So to sum up, Canadian families are seeing unaffordable prices, increases in their foods that they buy to feed their families year over year. And almost daily, my constituency office is hearing from Canadians, young and old, who are having difficulty getting by. And many don't have enough money to buy groceries after rent and mortgage payments are made. More and more people are visiting food banks. And too many are breaking down in tears in my office because of their inability to pay for the basic necessities of life. Dozens and hundreds of my constituents are having trouble making ends meet because of runaway inflation that this government has caused. Canadian consumers, they face inflation on food at 8 to 9% year over year. Again, 20% of Canadians report skipping a meal a day just to save money on groceries. Meanwhile, the government taxes to the max with carbon tax one and now carbon tax two, plus the HST piled on top tax on tax. Speaker, enough is enough. Canadians deserve better than a Prime Minister and a government that just seems to go through the motions. The Prime Minister can deny it all he wants, but Canadians know that inflation is real. The bill doesn't go far enough to address the lack of competition amongst grocery retailers, and sadly, this Prime Minister, who's propped up by NDP supporters as well as Liberals who sit in this House, have not seen a regulation that they wouldn't support nor a carbon tax that they wouldn't impose to burden and weigh down Canadian families who are just trying to make ends meet with their hard-earned dollars and stretching their hard-earned dollars. At the fuel pumps, they're paying 
they're, they're paying at the fuel pumps, they're paying in their heating bills, and having enough money left over to get through their grocery checkout line is sometimes a burden. It's time for a real change from the inflationary, all too costly coalition of the NDP Liberal government. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thanks, Madam Speaker. And I listened with interest to the member opposite speech. Um, inflation is real. I don't think anyone's denying that. But we have, uh, we've provided assistance. You mentioned uh, rising rents. We've provided assistance through the National Housing Strategy. And program after program that's been presented to this House has been opposed by the opposition. We've provided assistance through the Rapid Housing Initiative, the Innovation Fund, the National Co-Investment Fund providing more support for co-ops that a lot of members in this House have talked about and the need to drive investments through municipalities and nonprofits. Um, so every time this government has tried to assist Canadians, uh, those in need, some of our most vulnerable populations, the member opposite and her leader um, have chosen to vote against it. My question is why? Honourable Member for uh, Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank my colleague across the way for the question. Well, the fact of the matter is a one-time payment is not going to do anything to help people long term. My constituent here writes, Leanne, renters need apartments that working people can afford. I make $27 per hour and I have no benefits. And my rent for a 400 square foot one bedroom unit is currently $1,400 a year, plus electricity and I have to pay for laundry. Rent needs to come down or I will have no retirement savings less left. And that's Paula from Wallaceburg. And Jolene from Dover Centre writes me, an average hardworking Canadian like my husband and I... Have to, have to give time for other questions. Questions et commentaires. Uh, the Honourable Member for Courtney Alberney. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I can do a little fact check here. The member talked about uh, the Governor of the Bank of Canada, Tiff Macklin. Tiff Macklin said that the carbon tax, all of it combined, is contributing 0.15% to inflation. Madam Speaker, that's 15 cents on $100 worth of groceries. But what she didn't talk about is corporate greed, which is costing $3.90 on $100 worth of groceries. We know why, because Conservatives are gatekeepers for the big grocery stores, for the Galen Westons, Madam Speaker. Also, they don't want to talk about the fact that eight out of 10 Canadian families get a rebate. They don't want to talk about that, Madam Speaker. Why? Because they know that the, the truth is they're really fighting for two out of 10 Canadians. So my question to my colleague, will she tell the truth that the Conservatives are really fighting for the two out of 10 families that aren't getting a carbon tax rebate back and that they're actually just trying to deter from reality? Thank you. The Honourable Member for Lambton, Kent Middlesex. Thank you for, to my colleague for his question, but I take, I take offence to that because I am telling the truth. What you're referring to is actually only on food. Madam Speaker, what the member is referring to is on food. And you ask the farmers how their bills have gone up with the carbon tax. Ask me how much my inputs have gone up. Ask me how much packaging has gone up for, for my, my products. Ask people, retailers, why packaging has gone up. Because the carbon tax is paid on fuel that delivers every single thing along the supply chain. And when the fuel prices go up, everything along the supply chain goes up. So unless we ax the tax, you're not going to see reprieve. We need to ax the carbon tax and give families back more money in their pockets, not some one-time re grocery rebate that was masked as a grocery rebate when it's actually an HST rebate. Questions and comments? The other questions and comments? The Honourable Deputy de Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Verchères. Merci, Madame la Présidente. J'ai écouté le, le discours de mon collègue, puis comme de, de, de ces, les, les gens qui l'ont précédé avant elle, du côté des conservateurs, puis... Puis comme, je dirais, peut-être même les, les gens du, de l'autre côté de la Chambre, au gouvernement, puis euh, la, les gens de, la, de leur coalition, euh, à l'effet qu'on doit jouer sur l'offre par rapport au logement, notamment. Puis euh, je pense que tout le monde est d'accord avec ça, on doit jouer sur l'offre. Je pense que le gouvernement a un gros rôle à jouer là-dessus, puis il n'en fait pas assez. Mais il y a aussi deux de côtés à une situation. Quand il manque de logement, c'est parce qu'il y a des gens qui en veulent des logements. Euh, et ça, j'entends personne en chambre en parler pourtant, parce que euh, pourtant, c'est dans les médias partout, on en parle, mais pas dans cette chambre. Comment ça se fait que les arrivées massives, en fait, de, 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 les arrivées records de nouveaux arrivants, notamment euh, par, par rapport à, aux travailleurs étrangers temporaires, il n'y a personne qui veut en parler dans cette chambre, alors que pourtant, c'est quelque chose qui est en contrôle du gouvernement fédéral? The Honourable Member for Lambton, Kent Middlesex, in 25 seconds. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank my colleague for his question. Well, 
part of the reason why we can't get houses built is because for, we can't even get workers to work. I have a young a mom of a young adult who says to me, my adult son completed college and has a full-time job, does training, traveling as requested and duties, and can't afford to live or rent near work. He lives at home, drives over an hour each way, pays too much in gas to save for a mortgage or first and last on a rental, looked into an electric vehicle and put down a deposit to purchase, but can't afford the higher insurance, not to mention the higher payments, could not find any government rebates or incentives. His work, which he absolutely loves, is a very skilled and specialized. I we have to resume debate. Uh, the Honourable Member for London Fanshawe.